Now coming to types of data, we all understand the power behind data. It helps to accurately and precisely define a parameter, a factor, its level. And many of you would be clear about this concept as well. But let's quickly refresh it. Here's a paragraph. Let me read it for you. It says, let's assume there is a new unknown club in the city. And this club is organizing a grand New Year's party to mark its opening on the New Year's Eve and also to compete with other known clubs. They decide to invite the alumni of a well-known college including the freshers, juniors and seniors. So obviously only a finite number of people are invited. It's a beautiful evening with sky painted in divine colors of orange, yellow, red, blue, white and grey and with ambient temperature at 23.2 degrees Celsius even the weather is very pleasant and full attendance can be seen with the parking full boards on both upper and lower basements. Now can you find out what could be the maximum number of people attending the party? You have been given that no two person has exactly the same number of hair and no person has more than 500 hair and no one has exactly 500 hair too and there are more people in the party than there is hair on the head of any person. So can you think of the answer? The intention here uh, is not to challenge you with the puzzle but walk you through a data identification exercise. Ah, hey man, who asked you? He is one curious guy. Yeah, but he is right. That's okay. I'm sure you will figure out the answer yourself. Uh, let's see what types of data can we see in this paragraph. First, we see in reference to club, its characteristic has been described as known and unknown. Then we find the colors of the sky described as orange, yellow, red, blue, etc. We see the basement being classified as upper and lower. We see invitees categorized as freshers, juniors and seniors. Then we can see the ambient temperature at 23.2 degrees Celsius. We also see a reference to the number 500. Now a simple quality based categorization like these two columns here is called nominal data and this can be binary and non-binary. A quality based categorization that uses some kind of a ranking is called ordinal data which also can be binary and non-binary. And this set of data types are categorical and they are grouped under qualitative data. Now this is the most common and most desired data form that is the continuous data. Based on the least count of the measurement system it can take up to any decimals and can be that much more representative. This is the count data and is commonly referred to as discrete data. This is quite common in the services sector and this set of data types are grouped under quantitative data and why was it important to refresh us of the data types here because we need to know when to choose ANOVA in hypothesis testing only when our response data is continuous and our predictors or factors are discrete or categorical we use ANOVA like if we want to analyze, uh, let's say the ambulance response time to an emergency call in three cities to find out if one of the cities perform better than others and can one of the city be benchmarked. That's when ANOVA finds its application. The next pit stop is the distributions and first comes normal distribution. 
This has been adequately explained in part uh, 4 of our tutorial on understanding the sigma level. So here we will just touch upon the key aspects. Now normal distribution, it is a bell shaped frequency curve that's symmetric about the mean, which means the area on either side of the mean is equal. In such a case, obviously the mean, median and mode would be equal. Other important part to know is how data is spaced or distributed in normal distribution. We would find 31% of the population data between the range of mean plus minus of one standard deviation. This standard deviation is for the long term. If we take the short term standard deviation, these percentages will slightly vary. And we find 69% of the data in the range of mean plus minus of two standard deviation and 99.99966% of data in the range of mean plus minus six standard deviation. This distribution, that is the normal distribution, is very widely used in variety of applications. Now, coming to the significance in ANOVA, we uh, analyze the response Y at various factor levels, that is X in case of ANOVA. Here the assumption is that the Y data and the associated error terms or what we call residuals follow a normal distribution. And even the calculated stats in ANOVA table, which we use for interpretation, uses F stat and the associated P value. This F distribution again is derived from normal distribution. So it's important to know the basic properties of normal distribution such that our interpretation job when we are getting into ANOVA becomes easy. Next important distribution as we discussed is the F distribution. So first let's understand how this F distribution is formed. So this distribution is formed by drawing two random and independent samples from two different normal populations. Let's say the size of the samples that we are drawing is N1 and N2. The sample standard deviation is S1 and S2 and the standard deviation of the population from where these samples have been drawn is sigma 1 and sigma 2. Then the ratio S1 square to sigma 1 square divided by S2 square to sigma 2 square gives us F statistic and a distribution from all possible F stat values is the F distribution with degrees of freedom N1 minus 1 and N2 minus 1 at a significance level of alpha. It's normally a skewed distribution as we see here on the slide and the shape depends on the degrees of freedom of the two samples that constitute the F distribution. From an academic point of view, it's good to know that the F distribution is also explained using the chi-square distribution. Now what is this chi-square distribution? It's very simple. It is a result of plotting the squared means of samples drawn from a standard normal distribution. What is standard normal distribution? It is a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. So from this standard normal distribution, if you draw samples, take means and plot the means, the resulting distribution is going to be a chi-square distribution. So if x and y are two independent chi-square random variables with u and v as degrees of freedom, then the ratio x by u divided by y by v follows F distribution. So that's about F distribution. Now in ANOVA, since we analyze the variance in response at different factor levels, we test our hypothesis by comparing the calculated test statistic with critical distribution parameter. Since we are comparing variance, we use F stat 
and hence F distribution and knowledge about it becomes important. I hope this video was useful. We would always be delighted to see your likes, comments and mails as we consider you an integral part of our learning endeavor. Keep watching this space as we plan to host more learning videos on concepts from DMAC, Lean, DFSS, Reengineering, Theory of Constraints, BPM and Operations Research. Please do subscribe to the page and keep receiving updates as and when we upload a new tutorial. Do share the links or channel details in your group so we end up creating a much larger learning community. In case you want us to talk about any specific concept, feel free to contact us. The contact details are mentioned here on the slide as well as on the page. So good luck and happy learning.